five years ago, I entered the Comrades Marathon and I trained for it and I got sick a few days before. So I ended up seconding a mate of mine. And after he finished, the first thing I told him was how exhausted I was from seconding him. <laughs> and our guest today has run 30 Comrades Marathons, one nine of them set five course records. And a few years well, around that time, also ran the London to Brighton, which he won three times and set a 50-mile world record, which stood for 36 years. Since then, has launched the park run in almost 200 locations in Southern Africa with over or about a million subscribers, arguably the most successful runner and most influential runner in the history of South Africa. So I'm super honored to introduce you, Bruce. Welcome, Bruce Fordyce. Yeah, you can introduce me anytime you like. Very <laughs> You didn't mention the Sydney Marathon, so I deliberately wore the t-shirt just so you know. But there we go. Yeah. Did you win that as well? No. <laughs> I, I, I went in the pub afterwards. Oh, awesome. So, so Bruce, there's a, there's a struggle story, which I, which I love. And I remember you telling the story briefly at one of the book launches way back and you ran with a black armband during apartheid and there was something about the cameras and the way they were treating you. Could you tell us that story? So that was the 1981 comments. What happened was in 1981 was 20 years of nationalist government apartheid rule and the nationalist government decided to celebrate with a whole lot of tank parades and cultural events and fly pass and politicians in those big, you remember those big Homburg hats lecturing with their fingers like that and giving speeches. And sadly, comrades agreed to be one of those events that would celebrate 20 years of apartheid. I don't know why, who, who was thinking what, but anyway. And at the time, I was a passionate student at WITS, and the campaign at the time for those who were opposed to the idea was no cause to celebrate. So everywhere you saw these t-shirts, no cause to celebrate and whatever. And and so a lot of runners withdrew from the race when they saw that they were going to be part of this. But those of us who selfishly like me, I knew I had a very good chance of winning because I'd had a second and a third place before that, and I was going for the win. We got together and decided we could still run, but we would show our displeasure by wearing black armbands. So that's what we did. And we na naively thought that you could just go along and, you know, show your displeasure and you and I disagree, but we can run. But whoa, we were incredibly unpopular. And I need to emphasize it wasn't just me. It was a group of about 50 or 60 people in the race. Um, but I was the high profile one because I was out in front. And, yeah, I got hit with a couple of tomatoes and an egg. <laughs> and there was one family of, I don't know, there must have been a Catholic family. They had about six children. And they wow. lined up on the side like the like the Von Trapp family singers from, from Sound of Music. They were lined yeah. up and they went past. They went boo, 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 boo. boo. <laughs> like and, and they booed me. And so I was a very unpopular winner. And it was very difficult for the SABC to cover the race without showing the armband because here's this blooming Batucha communist Vitsi leading and so what they did was that they tried to film me from the side that didn't have the armband on because it was on my – but all I did was when I saw the camera turn, I would take the armband off and put it on the other <laughs> arm. And then what they didn't know was the in the lead vehicle, the cameraman was an old schoolmate of mine, Peter Brady, and he his – sympathies were the same as mine so he did his utmost to fill my armband <laughs> so, yeah so that was it was a i was a very unpopular winner of the race um but not on robin island as nelson mandela once told me many years later but there i was a popular winner awesome so do you, were there any runners who who didn't who you think could have been super great who never got a chance to compete during that period oh i'm sure there were i'm sure there were hundreds you know, who just yeah. simply the daily grind and struggle of trying to stay alive interfered with any dreams of, of becoming a, a full-time or a, certainly a winning athlete. I was still teaching at Vitz. I, I was in the archaeology department and, and I was still teaching. But, you know, when you're an academic or a student studying, there's, yeah, you have to work hard, but there's plenty of time to organize your training around that. And yeah. I fairly soon after I'd come second and third in comrades, I picked up a, a sports bursary from Vitz University, a thousand rand, <laughs> which is quite a lot of money in those days. <laughs> yeah. And another person they, they gave a bursary to a couple of years later was Mark Plikes, and he went on to be world champion, marathon world champion. So wow. the, some of those, oh, I'm switching this off immediately. Some of those bursaries were very well, uh, sorry, 
no, rookie, that's rookie no, errors. So I'm anyway. into, no, that's fine. Just yeah. so you know, like I was interviewing Tim Noakes the other day and someone came to drop something at his house and couldn't get in. So he was like knocking on the window while Tim was in the interview. So he got up, oh, okay. up, he got up for five bad. minutes and went and got the door and <laughs> we could hear him in the background <laughs> okay. speaking to the yeah, guy. Yeah. But yeah. Tim's like, he's a true academic. Yeah, yeah. yeah his he, mind is elsewhere. Yeah. So in fact, so I've been reading your book. Yeah. Um, which is super cool. I, I love the story you told about the Star Wars movie when you all thought you were going to get to see a, oh, yeah. another movie. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, but yeah, for those of you um, who haven't read this, highly recommend. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, and I'll let you talk more about it in, in, yeah, in, yeah. in detail later. But the, the thing that stood out to me. Hey, absolutely. Shameless self promotion is what you self- do. So, shameless. Yeah, so, but the story is about your first. Um, and the training for it and everything. Yeah. And when I was interviewing Tim, he said that you were basically about to die uh, in the last five Ks and your dad gave you a Coke and that gave you the the push to get over the end of the line or something along the lines of, of, of a little bit of Coke, like save the day. Yeah, so so actually it wasn't my first comrades. Okay. In, in the at time of my first comrades, it was the doctor Vitz Ivan Cohen who was doing a lot of research into dehydration. We always we all thought that dehydration was the great enemy, so he was doing research into which fluids get drained from the stomach fastest to fight dehydration. And we didn't, in those days, understand that if you are carbohydrate dependent, as we all were, you have to take carbohydrates to race because it's like you you're dependent on on cocaine and you don't have your cocaine, so you better get some. So yeah. it was actually the, my third comrades, 1979. When I got to Poly Shorts, I moved into third place and I was I had been flying and then obviously it's Poly Shorts, so it's a toughie, but it's um, actually my stepfather, who was a doctor as well, Rayleigh Whitaker and a, and a runner, he saw me going gray and he said, don't tell Bruce. He took a bottle of, of Coke that I used to run on kind of a mixture of Coke and water, which was so flat Coke. But without telling me, he added about three or four spoonfuls of table sugar to it. And I just changed gear. I went, I shot up the second half of that hill and I shot all the way to the finish. And I knew when they, my seconds came out to me and listen from the top of Holly Shorts, it's only about two more times they can see you. But when they came out to me, I said, I want that bottle. I don't want any other bottle. I want that one because I knew. And then after the race, Tim contacted me and said, okay, Bruce, you're, you were the only runner that day whose second half was faster than his first half. And your second half was markedly faster. What did you do? So I told him. And so Tim and I and a marathon runner called Bernie Rose went on to create, uh, because Tim said, well, sugar is great, but they're much more, much more um, effective sugars like corn sugar. So I don't know what we did to ourselves in terms of the Alzheimer's we're going to get later on in life. As we fried a billion brain cells each. But so we yeah. brought out this drink, this thing, which the gels, we were the very first gels, unflavored. Called like the FRN. goo that you get now. Yeah, the goo. And, yeah. and so the FRN that we bought out stood for four dice, rose and noakes. And that was, yeah, we, a company made it and we got a small percentage. I know Tim unselfishly would have donated it towards his research stuff, but as a student, I was very grateful for the money. And, and so that was how, what we ran on in those days, yeah. That's amazing. And so tell me about the, the nutrition philosophy, sort of, because you had long periods of, of, of training before a race, and then you would have had, like, what you do in the last couple of days before the race and then on the race. So what was the kind of, like, the daily bread, as it were, as a training? Yeah, so I trained, I, I trained throughout the year with this, to have a steady base. So that would be 120 Ks a week. For me, that was nothing. You know, that's, like, 120 Ks a week. Doing, in, the, in my off season, doing as much speed work as I could. So yeah. because I was aware as an ultra marathon runner that my vulnerability lay in that I was slow compared to the faster marathon. I was running against Johnny Halberstadt, you know, those those Ty Kevin Shaw, they were two ten marathon runners, sixty five wow. minute half marathoners. I was a two seventeen and I just needed to close that gap. So I did a lot of a lot of like B League track races. You'd find me on a fr- Friday night running a three thousand meter race with all the oh. days you hunt for and Dion Brimmer and and Matthews Tamani, all of those guys. And I was always proud of the fact that they didn't lap me. But but it was very good for me. And then, so that would be my off-season. But when the main season came, 12 weeks to go, about 10 to 12 weeks to go, then I would jump it up to 160, 220 kilometers a week. 
So that's twice a day, morning, evening, morning, evening. And then, and then as it got closer to the race, then I would start throwing a bit of quality to sharpen up. So yeah. I, didn't have to, I didn't have to do a long run to find out whether I was ready for comrades. I didn't need to do a 60K, although I did do 60K training runs very slowly, yeah. but I didn't need to do one fast to find out that I was ready to run comrades. What I needed to do was break 30 minutes for 10Ks. And that I would do quite regularly, like a 29.50. If I could do three minutes a K for 10, then I knew I was ready for for comrades. And so that I would bump it up. But then I also was a huge fan of a long taper. So three weeks before race day, I would start to cut my mileage drastically. In, it's still doing the quality, so I'm keep staying sharp, cut the mileage. And then with one week to go, I used to do with a few of my friends a thing called the Sultan Diet. The Sultan yeah. Diet was a so you diet. You mentioned that in the book, yeah. yeah. The Swedish long distance cyclist invented it, and it was brought into running by one of the great heroes of marathon running, who sadly had just recently died, Dr. Ron Hill. And notice I'm saying doctor because he had a PhD in chemistry. Um, and he he brought it into his own marathon running and he swore by it. And that is that you, you go for a last longish, like a 25 kilometer, seven days to go training run where you deplete all your your glycogen stores. And then for the next three days, you you uh, cut out all carbohydrates in your diet and you carry on running. So essentially you go banting, but he would never have known of that expression. None of us would have. And that was for us the tough phase. I could never have imagined right. yeah. trying. I can't <laughs> ima- I could, in those days, I could not have imagined trying to live on that kind of a diet for more than three days. I was nearly demented after three days. Just And, and what I did with the discipline is every time I saw something that I wanted to eat carbohydrate-wise, I would buy it. So I would buy a jam donut, but I would put it in the fridge. And I would buy a block of chocolate, and I put it in the fridge. I'm not eating. And then on the on the fourth day, you switch, and you stop training altogether, and you just eat carbohydrates. You don't pig out, but every time you have a meal, you eat carbohydrates. And the idea was that your carbohydrate stores loaded. You had a, yeah. a liver with an excessive load of, of glycogen, and now you've got an extra big fuel tank for the 90Ks. Now, I have no idea why it worked. But I wrote in my book about how I understood how Iron Age peoples smelted iron. And when they smelted iron, they did all the correct scientific steps, like hard wood. They used, they used bellows to get the oxygen in. They used uh, termite mound earth to make their kiln because that can take ferocious heat. Uh, and, but then they also did some steps that are not necessary to smelt iron, like they put mooties in and they drank beer and no women were allowed to be present. But they got the recipe right every time and they smelted iron. So they didn't leave out a step. So I don't know if the diet worked or not, but I got the recipe right every single time. So I didn't want to leave that out. And Ron yeah. Hill swore by it. He swore by it. And on the diet back in those days, he won the Commonwealth Games, the European Champs, the Boston Marathon, and the only one that he failed on was the Olympic marathon. Why? Because the three days of the diet of the carbo loading phase, the Israeli athletes massacre happened in 1972 and the Olympic committee made an extra day of no athletics mourning the dead Israeli athletes. And so Ron was on four days. He still blamed. He had to go four days carbo high. He f- said he yeah. felt heavy because of course every gram i don't know i'm not that, that but every gram of carbohydrate you load you load a gram of water so it's kind of it's four actually yeah so it's yeah, four, yeah so but there you go yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Well, that worked for me perfectly and i never changed it and I smelted iron every time that's amazing because you know boxers do that as well hey? like the, yeah. and in fact um like fitness models you know when people get super ripped for photographs they yeah, they, yeah, do yeah. Keep, they they go keto for for like three keto. or four days yes and then they and then they and then the day before the shoot, they, they carb up and it just pumps all their muscles, but they're, yeah. they're dehydrated I, as well. So I can say this. You see, I don't know because the last three days I didn't run on the carbs. So by the time you get to race day, you're champing at the bit to go. Mm. You know, you, you just want to run because you haven't had a run for three days. So yeah. So I don't know whether that was the key, but it worked. Yeah, that's amazing. So, I mean, that's torture though. Like <laughs> just run, well, basically opening the taps and running out for 50 Ks to empty your muscles. Like the, yeah. what's it like when you hit the wall at the end of that run? Well, then of course, then what you do, of course, is then you take the high carbs while you're running. You take yeah. the yeah. nice rose and nokes FRN and, <laughs> and you just keep taking that all the way through to the end. You know, and, and so then you, then you, but that's because you're carbohydrate dependent at, yeah. in that space, desperately so. So what are you eating in a in a 220k week of running? 
You know, not, and I ate. A, I was a student, so I mean, I ate, our favorite meal was to go to the Vitz Canteen, st- sit around playing cards, talking about the um, slap chips and gravy. So you could get a huge plate of chips and you put salt, and then you got this gravy, which was probably just actually corn, you know, like wheat and corn flour just, uh, or something. Yeah, yeah, some yeah. cubes in. But we chucked that on, and then we would have coffee with about three spoons of sugar. And I was a typical student. A, a double cheeseburger was fantastic. If I went home to visit the parents, then I'd eat mom's food, you know. But, um, yeah, high carbs back in those days. And then, of course, being a student, there was a place called the Devonshire Pub, <laughs> the Devonshire pub was bad news. <laughs> yeah. So lots of carbs consumed there as lots well. Of carbs <laughs> coming home because I, I, when I was postgraduate, then I started living in a flat in Bramfontein, and I could still remember we would come home at what, about one o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning, singing "Ayo, Ayo, Daylight Come," and I want "Hey, Mister Tallyman, Tally me banana." We were experts. <laughs> Oh, uh, that's classic. So, and then what about so on the race? It was basically coke and water, and uh, and then I mean, going stronger and stronger, more and more sugar, sort of as race. it got further. Yeah. yeah. And what about was there a specific recovery regime? Anything? Beef curry and rice, because we're in India. I mean, in in the Indian part of Durban. So I'd have well, a curry. Like a what a, yeah. what is it, a, a bunny char, a solid bunny when you're in, in Durban? Yeah, something like that, you see, because I was born in the Far East, so you can't frighten me with chili. You can bring mother-in-law's hellfire vindaloo, and I'm, I will, uh, there'll be one wet. You know, I'm not, Mrs. Ball's extra hot. It's just got more vinegar in it. There's yeah. no chili in there. So, so now, can, yeah. no, no, so, so I don't actually know you retired from competitive running, but there was obviously a transition over the years where you yeah. sort of changed your so, diet. Well, and then I then well, I, I kind of when I lost my when I lost comrades for the first time. The, the fact the last one that I won, my sister lives lives in London, and she had never been out to see me. So the last one that I won, nineteen ninety, she came out to watch me run comrades, and the comrades association treated her like a VIP, which was wonderful. They put her in the lead vehicle, and she watched the whole race, and she was the first one to hug me when I crossed the line. But she still reminds me that. When I crossed the line and I hugged her, I said, it's over. I won't win another one. Uh, because that one, I was very lucky to win. Mark Page, insurmountable lead. And I was not going to catch him, but then he started walking. And then when I saw him, I saw him on poly shorts. But I'd given up. I was settling for second. And then I saw him on poly shorts. And when I saw him, that was like the red rag. you know. And I was off. Um, yeah. And then I got him and I passed him. And so, but I knew that race was given to me. I didn't win it. It was given to just, me. Just hang on a second. Let's just go and unpack that for a second here. If, if, he, if he bombed out because he pushed it too hard or wasn't prepared enough to finish the whole race, doesn't that mean that you won fair and square? Yes, but um, yeah, I, I just, I think Mark. He might have. So what happened was he was 10 ahead of me at one stage and then the gap went to eight minutes and then it went to six minutes. So maybe the pressure of knowing that four dice is coming might have got to him a little bit. And he was very inexperienced. If he'd had a decent team of seconds with him, they, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, Alberto Salazar, when he won in 1994, he was broken. Absolutely bang up body shorts. And he would, and Nick Bester was coming like a train, but he had Ray Wixell seconding him and Ray Wixel is, Wixel is an athlete and a runner and Ray said yes he's catching you he's catching Alberta but if you just don't walk he will run out of real estate to catch you he will run out of distance and so that's yeah. what Alberta did he just hung in you know so I think maybe if somebody had talked Mark through he might have you get to the top of what you see I caught him near the top of Polly Shorts and then I went past him. If you can get over the crest of Polly Shorts, it's kind of six, seven Ks downhill. And well, there are a couple of hills, but you're kind of home and dry if you can get there because the person so chasing you. a mental you, barrier you know, to get over. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but you've got to get over there. Yeah. Okay. And so, okay. So then after that, you sort of tapered off slightly. And then. Yeah. And then I, and then I carried on running and I, you know, I still raced a bit, but you know, it was over at Comrades and things like that. So it wasn't going to get a marathon PB. In fact, the PBs were over. And so then I, but I'd, I've always been in running for life. I'm not going to stop. At the moment, I've got a stress fractured ankle from the two oceans and I've got no, no um, cartilage in my right knee. My family wants me to stop and I said, you better stop because then I'll be the grumpiest, worst 
most unbearable person to live with. Just let me hobble around. At least I'm just not going to do any ultras, you know, and stuff like that. Yeah. So what happened when you discovered Banting? Because so the only reason I know you discovered Banting is because I actually met you at a launch in 2013 or 14. Yeah, so what happened was, as with all of us, just middle age spread. I mean, I just started to get larger and heavier, and I couldn't believe it because all my life I had been absolutely, you know, the skinniest guy. I loved my rugby at school. What was I? I was a number nine. I was a scrum half. That's the only position you can put me. Um, yeah. The smallest guy, the, the one who causes the most trouble, like the <laughs> Jack Russell, but he but he doesn't do any of the action in the scrum. Um, yeah. And and uh, and then suddenly this thing started happening to me where I just was getting heavier, and I, I there, there was a and I carried on by the way as you know, as you said in your introduction I ran thirty comrades well some of them I did in ten hours with buddies and whatever, not worried about my time, but there was a photograph of me crossing the line in the two oceans, and I looked at it and I thought you you've got a you've got a book because I had just crossed the line and I as you crossed the line I would like I'd relax yeah. I had this book, and I thought, nah, that's not a book. What it is, it's your number. Your race number has curled round and folded round. It's just and the shadow. And then I looked at it a bit more closely, and I thought, uh-uh, you've got a book. <laughs> and then there was a great photograph of a whole bunch of us had gone on holiday, great friends in Mozambique, and there was a photograph of my mate Gary Harlow coming out of the water after doing some body surfing. And he looked strong but big, you know. And I said, what a great picture of Gary. And Jill, my wife, said, no, Bruce, that's a photo of you. Uh, <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, and then, and then I went. And, and, and then I used to have an annual, like, executive. And my doctor at the time looked and said, no, Bruce, as usual, all your – everything's wonderful. But we just can see – that your liver is starting to take a bit of a hammering. And I thought, well, that's alcohol. And then I thought, no, it isn't. I've actually been going through quite a quiet few weeks. It's actually my liver is trying to cope with the carbohydrates I'm hitting it with. And then all these things came together. And I don't know what I'm chatting to Tim and, and, and then chatting to Sean Micklejohn, who won the 95 comrades. He got as large as anything. He ran 20 comrades and he gave up. He's wow. told his family, I've, I've won it. I've reached a dream. I've got several gold medals. I'm retiring after 20. And after six years, he was in. And he went back to his family and said, guys, I have to run again. And I have to diet. And I saw him at a comrades function and he'd got thin again. I said, Sean, what have you done? And he said, Bruce, at our age, we have to diet. We have to think about it. And I thought, I don't get it. I'll just, being lazy, I'll double my mileage. I'll go start running again. And it didn't work. And yeah. so one day, I, I, I wish I had marked the day. I just came down for my morning run. And I always had a cup of coffee, two or three spoons of sugar. And I just thought this morning, no sugar. And I hated it. And I went out and I ran, came down the next morning. For two weeks, I hated it. Hated, no sugar in my tea or coffee. But the results, I wish I could say this to people who are struggling. The results are instantaneous. They're not, they're not three months from now you're going to. It's instant. I mean, within a week, I had lost two kgs just by giving up the sugar in my tea and coffee. My times at the, in those days at the, at the um, Rockies time trial on a Saturday morning at Zoo Lake, Five Ks. My times came down by two. My race was incredible. So then I was so super excited. I said, okay, let's give up bread. Even better results. Let's give up. Okay, let's go the whole hog. No more pasta. No more potatoes. None of that stuff. Unbelievable. Straight. That's like changing it. religions for, a, for the history that you've had. That's like going against every bit of every history you've thing. ever followed. Every single – we have been lied to for – just decades. You know, and the wow. worst thing about it, here's, the, here's how stupid I am. I taught the subject. I'm an archaeologist. Philip Tobias, one of the world's great experts on the early hominids, lectured me. What were we, hunter-gatherers? What are we still, hunter-gatherers? Our digestive systems over millions of years have not suddenly got used to a Chelsea bun. These yeah. digestive systems are designed to eat animals, and especially we fought. We've got the we've got the, the the excavations of the fires. We cracked open the bones of the animals and ate the marrow. And yes, some berries and bitter fruits in season, and the odd leafy green vegetables or something. But what we really wanted, 
And we were the greatest hunters ever because we chased after animals and ran them into exhaustion. We mm-hmm. can sweat. We've got great springs and ligaments and tendons and whatever. And I'd, we've forgotten it. We've forgotten it. And now the powers that we, they don't want us to find out. Yeah, the so there's the best in 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 junk food and in and in uh, carbohydrates. Yeah, you've got to have your five five vegetables and fruits a day. Absolutely. And you um, the health the health breakfast they serve you. What's it? Eleven vitamin, vitamins, vitamins, minerals, and honey, and, 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 and whatever. That's the least healthy thing on the breakfast menu. But anyway, let's. Yeah. You know. But anyway, it worked for me. And I don't want to sound evangelical, you know, because people can get so upset. But, and I'm not so rude that if I came to your place and you have made me a pasta, you know, I will eat it and I'll enjoy it. But the next day I'm back on the program. And then I'm yeah. a hypocrite because, as I've already hinted a couple of times, I enjoy the odd glass of wine or the, the, odd, uh, the odd glass of whiskey or whatever. So there's quite a lot of sugars in those things. Well, it's not Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, it's, it's, um, yeah. it's, be, it's being generally healthier. So making healthier, more healthy decisions more often, I think, is, is really what the key is. And a healthy healthy. decision even is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. obviously, yeah. If, if, it's, if you're at the Pirates Club and it's the Springboks against England, 19, 2019, and there's five minutes to go and Cheslin Col- Colby scores that try, there's going to be a few drinks. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, can we talk about uh, per- performance mindset for a bit? I'm I'm keen to hear about your experience of the pain cave, and perhaps you could talk about, you know, what your visualizations were, if any, during training, especially with a race so long and such a long builder. What is going through your mind? What are you thinking about when you're planning your training and you're thinking about getting ready for? A yeah, race? so I, I used to do a little bit of mental rehearsal stuff, but it had to be real. So it would be. In, let's say it would be in early May, if you're talking about a comrades that's end of May or 1st of June, sometime like that. Then while I was running, but it wouldn't be like a, I would, I would be running on my own. I, I used to do a midweek Wednesday run of about 25 to 30 Ks in the, in the afternoon. Most of my running actually was evening running, afternoon, evening. And then, I, and then it would get dark because it's beginning of winter. And I would run around, you know, be running on familiar streets or whatever and going nicely. I mean, you see, so I'm very fit. I'm very thin. I'm very fit. And one of my tests was I like to play. I like to, oops, I like to tap each of my fingers with my thumb while I was running. That means I'm very relaxed. I'm not, you know, when you are oh, like that, you, you bunched up and you tight here, but I was loose and I did that play. And then I, my mind would just wander and I would say, okay, poly shorts. But it wasn't like, are you going to do that today? It would just happen, accident, poly shorts. And I would do poly shorts in my mind. Here I am, and not impossible because nobody sprints up poly shorts, but here, one foot in front of the other. I'm just not stopping. There's the lead vehicle with the press. There's the TV camera. Here's some of the spectators, the side of the road clapping. I could smell the bry smoke, but I'm going up to the top of poly. And I promise you, I'd get there on race day. And on race day, I, I would get goosebumps on this thing. I've been here before. Mm. I've been here before already in my mind, and I know what I've got to do. I just, yes, there's a little bit of a cramp coming, but that's fine. Just just don't stop. Um, so I would do stuff like that. Um, I always had music. I have a favorite theme music for the year. Could be anything from classical to reggae. And and then my my uh, training diary. Now, funny enough, I have one here. Though this is this is there you are. That's that's a four dice training diary. Also, I look down on computers or something like that because one dollar. Yeah. It's all in there. You see. So it's all it's all there. It is. Oops. So that is that yeah, so that's journaling yeah. j- journaling yeah. about your experience. No, I've, got every, I've got every single one. Uh, what's this one? Seventy nine to eighty one. So that's winning comrades. That's there. There's what I wrote about winning comrades. See in red. Those are my wow. notes about my one. And then in the beginning, I I would like a prisoner who's counting all the days until he gets freed from jail. I would tally up all my Ks, you see. And when I knew that I had got to X number of Ks by May, then you're ready to run. Now, so did anyone did teach another, you that? Sorry? Did anyone teach you that? No, no, no. I just started from day one. That's that's in my book. My first run was 10 minutes around the Vitz rugby fields. I recorded that. That's insane. Do you know that's like the the – 
high performance coaches and the Stoics, if you go, go online and you're like, what makes greatness? They'll tell you now, like you need a journal and you have like, you need to be crossing off things. And Stoicism yeah. is all about like knowing that you're going to die. So that's, that's quite profound actually. That <laughs> you're doing that in the eighties. Seventies. Seventies. Yeah. Seventies. That's insane. And, and then when you, so a lot of people think that, that there's something genetically different about the people who win. And, uh, and I'm always surprised to hear about athletes who, who have suffered with injuries and pain. Uh, and now I've decided that actually people who win just can, can just take more pain than the people who don't. So I don't well, know if you've got any stories about when you had to push through the pain cave and just make well, it happen. Well, oh, I think I've just gone offline. Okay. I've, I've only, I'm back. Can you okay, hear me? Cool. Yeah, yeah, I got you. So I've only discovered now that I ran 21 Ks at the two oceans with the stress fracture of my left fibula. So there was quite a lot of pain. <laughs> and I just kept going. You know, I just sort of I just suck it up and go. Uh, and it, I wasn't running fast. I was running with two friends of mine who were doing their first ever half marathon, first ever okay. two oceans. And um, so there was a fair bit of walking when needed to walk. And um, I had a, uh, you know, I was able to get a laugh at the top of Southern Cross Drive. I, I bumped into Tox van der Linde, who was doing up there. I mean, can you imagine getting a Springbok prop to talk to him? So he, he saw me and he spotted me and he said, how's it, Bruce? He said, oh, how are you going? I said, no, 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 Tox, I can't dilly-dally and chat you. This is my second lap. I'm leading. And he wasn't sure <laughs> if to believe me or not. <laughs> oh, that's great. They, uh, they really they planted a psychological time bomb at the top of Southern Cross this year because usually you, you get to the top of Southern Cross and that's kind of like the heavy lifting out of the and step. The and the Turn up the hill, yeah, that, little, that little kink. But anyway, yeah, so I mean, I obviously with pain, there is, you know, I mean, but the, one of the things I used to say to myself, if you're leading and you're hurting, imagine how the other guys are also hurting, you know? So it's kind of, and, and then I've got to say every now and again, I'm sure it must be like a golfer who has two years of the worst golf he's ever experienced in his life. And then one day he gets a birdie or a hole in one or a fabulous round where he equals par or something. So every now and again in running, you get one of those where you just, nothing goes wrong. Or whenever. And so if I had to go back in, the, in 1983, you could have made the race 10 Ks longer, I would have just carried on. And I was doing three and a half minutes a K at the end, you know, just nothing, nothing. I was waving at the crowd. My girlfriend at the time ran out. I gave her a kiss. You know, when you can do that kind of thing, then it's like perfect. And then I think 86, also had a fantastic run. 88 had a great run, but then the bad ones, like 82, <laughs> 82 against Alan Rob. Ooh, my dad held me up at the finish. So 81 was bad because that was the armband of the 85 I left on the drip. You know, so it's, it's a lot, you know, it's just, it depends. Was it a hot day? Was it a cold day? What were the tactics like? But what I find is that in most cases, uh, champions will find a way to win. So if you look at the most successful sports team of all time, it's the All Blacks. You know, their winning ratio compared to anything, you can bring in baseball, basketball, cricket, any. the All Blacks win ratio. I know recently they've lost a few, but their win ratio is so high. And they have that ability in the last 20 minutes to go from being behind to just digging out a win, even if it's a bad win, you know, it's an ugly win. They will just do it. So sometimes I think that's where where winners are very good at just make, making it happen in the end. I think when I caught Mark Page in that 1990 comrades, he probably got concerned when his second started saying, I'm coming, I'm coming. And then I was unkind when I saw him, his wife had just come back from being with him with a bottle. And I, I, I did this, whoops, I did this with an imaginary gun. I went, <laughs> like that in front of her, <laughs> which wasn't a kind thing to do. And I'm a, I'm a nice guy, but I'm a horribly competitive if I've decided to be competitive, yeah. And, and so where do you find that extra gear? Is there a certain thing that you tell yourself or is that, you know, are there any sentences that come up for you? Is there, What's the narrative going on in your in your mind when, when you find that gear? So for me, it was always just to try and get three minutes. If I could get three-minute lead, in comrades, that is, if I could get three minutes, because three minutes was almost a kilometer. And the other thing, get out of sight. Just get out of sight. So I might work very hard to get around the next bend so that when he comes, you're not there. And it's little sure. things like when you take a sponge, 
and you sponge or whatever and you have a drink, you don't drop it. You drop it on the road, it's lying there. It's a sign and it's got water oozing out of it. It's a sign you're just there. You, it's, mm. I, I don't like to pollute, but you throw it in the bush so that when he comes, there's nothing. You're gone. There's no sign that you were ever there. You're gone. You see, so it starts to give up. <laughs> and in fact, what I was, I was not great to mark that year because he's a teammate, but when I caught him, he said, who's, who's coming? And I said, is that Charlie's coming? He's coming like a train, Mark. So that made me, that made Mark start thinking, can I hang on to second? Yeah. Meanwhile, I didn't know where Hosea was. He could have been anywhere. I just thought of a name. I think, I think in, indeed, I think, no, Horse ended up being second. Yeah, he, he caught Mark too. Yeah, so, but I didn't know. I just like, I had to think yeah. of a run and make him worried. <laughs> That's hilarious. So now you're trying to teach, well, not trying, now you've it, it, you launched a business helping other athletes you know, even start their first comrades. And I think, and that, that's what this book's about. So why don't you tell me a little bit about why, why you wrote this book and who it's for? Okay. So don't get me on the subject of COVID because I promise you, this is not about that, but I can tell you when everyone says that all the disaster because of, because of COVID and because of the pandemic, the disaster was because of lockdown that governments put us in lockdowns created it, not the yeah. pandemic lockdowns all over the world. Millions of people lost their jobs unbelievable catastrophic decisions by government and scientists. So I've learned who to trust. And there's a lot of scientists who you'll never trust here. But anyway, for me, the one good thing that came out of it was I had to do. So I wrote this book and it's, um, I could have a book about how to win, but then I'm going to lose half my audience. I mean, my, my readership immediately. So I thought, no, just write about you as an ordinary guy running your first comment, your first comment, no idea you're going to win it one day. And you made it a project. And so what I did was I took these very self-same training diaries and I just transcribed what I did. So my first run was 10 minutes around the Vitz Rugby Field, June the 8th, 1976. And I could only run for 10 minutes. I didn't want to lose weight. I didn't want to get fit. I, it, I had one goal, to run the Comrades by chance a year later, because it was June the 8th. The next Comrades was May the 31st. And so I had a year to do that project. And so I wrote all that down. And then, I try, and then I put next to it notes, like this is a good idea, this is not a good idea, this is really foolish. And here I've got a, a really bad sore throat, but I'm carrying on running. What am I doing? This is really, you know, and, and this is a fantastic idea. And here you can see I'm getting fitter. So I did all that. And then I thought, but it's very dry and, and dull. So you're correct. I put in all the, I decided no to go and put in all the stories. So I put in all the stories of what happened at the time, you see, and um, like the movie. Yeah, <laughs> when we thought no, we were going to see, we thought we were going to see an interesting movie in the Dead Pits, and instead it was Star Wars, <laughs> and, and you know, and yeah, and just and and the politics of the time because uh, you know, ten days after I started running, well, eight days later was June the sixteenth, and I got horribly caught up in that whole action. So I put all that stuff down into it, and and I'm yeah, I, I, I'm quite proud of it. It's kind of who my heroes were. You know, who inspired mainly advice on how to run your first comrades and what, what I did. And then obviously because I chose my parents correctly, I'm genetically suited. I ran a I ran a silver first time. I mean I ran a six forty five. Did you know you were out. a runner? Did you know you could be good at running when you started out? I, I, I was always, you know, at school, at school athletics, I was when the, the teacher would say, Four dice, you're good at the long stuff, so you're doing the five thousand. Then I would win it. But, you know, winning at school, win the school cross country, I won that, you know. But winning at Woodmead School for hippies, artists, poets, and general academics of the world, that's what they've all become. They were all, my, yeah. all my schoolmates say, thank God, thank goodness for you, Bruce, because we needed one sports element to be the guy. Um, so winning there doesn't tell you that you're going to win internationally. You know, that's a different kettle of fish completely. So, but I knew that I, I was talented. But, you know, I mean, Alan Robb that year, he beat me by an hour. So Alan won the 77 comrades, which was my first. And I remember we invited him when I was at Bits. We invited him to be a speaker about two weeks before comrades. And we're just staring at him, thinking, he's ordinary, but he's won this race yeah. already. He won it once by that day. You know, he's won it. What's he got? I remember just, why? What's, you know, he just yeah. looks so ordinary. But well, that's what I loved about the book, you know, because I think that's the thing is when we see people who have done great things, we think that there's something extraordinary about their lives. Like they had an opportunity that yeah. we didn't have. And 
And what's so cool about this book, which I'm holding up again for those of you yes, who didn't see it, is that is that it it is so human. So you hear like you're literally a youngster studying, and you talk about the parties, and you just had this goal, and you like rammed it into your into your already busy. Yeah. Life. So I think that's super cool. I like that it's like that and not just a training schedule for someone to pick yeah. up. It's, and then, and then, of course, after that, I was completely hooked. So after the, yep. as, as, as with all comrades running, never, ever again, never, ever, ever again with other bad words. And then two days later, you're thinking, I wonder what the down run's like. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so tell us about the coaching business that you're running at the moment. Yeah. So then what happened is a mate of mine, Ian Mooreshead, who is a coach, got together with me and he said, Bruce, please – will you lend me your diaries, your training diaries? And I want to go through them and see how you train. And he came back to me and he said, I've got it. She said, I can distill everything you've done and you've done it correctly, obviously. And we can set up a thing called Ford Ice Fusion, which is we, we, tra- we coach everybody from people who just want to get a t- finish a 10K to comrades marathon Gold. It's been going unbelievably well. My, 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 my real test, because I had some, I've had some skin in the game, is my nephew, Robbie, and I know he wouldn't mind me saying this, but my nephew, Robbie, three years ago was down and out with an absolutely catastrophic alcohol and drug problem, and he got himself right. He got him right from that. He got out of it. Then he wanted a project, and there he, is. oops, uh, there's a, there's a, yeah, there's a, and that, that lovely lady, run, that's me in the London to Brighton. That lovely lady next to me is my sister, Una, seconding me. Right. She's smiling because she's run 70 meters. I'm a bit <laughs> grumpy because I've run 70 Ks at that stage. <laughs> anyway, so, we, so I, we got Robbie through Paris. This is a guy who was down and out. And three years later, Paris Marathon, 258. Whoa. So obviously Whoa. he's got the pair of genetics. You know, he's my nephew. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but now he'll go 245 next time. And he, he's... He was upset. He got that competitive because my first standard marathon was 245. And he was looking at it. I know he was looking at it. <laughs> but I told him, Robbie, 245 at your stage with what you've done to yourself is a bridge too far, but you'll get there, but not in one step. You know? Yeah. Uh, and so how does the coaching work? Is it online, remote? Well, the people apply and then we and then we use my principles and we and we coach them. We send them programs and then we monitor how they're going and then they yeah, and they say, we, we've just had the most wonderful feedback to you, Bruce. Thank you, Ian. Uh, we've got another coach coming on board, Frank, Frank Asensio. Frank is helping as well. We're going to be taking a group of Comrades runners in July to run the Comrades route over three days. So we'll do a 30 or something and a something, you know, to, to run the 90Ks. Um, and we will go every inch of the route, and I'll, I'll chat to the guys and tell them, this is what I would do at this stage, hang back here, you know, whatever, uh, or don't, whatever you do when you get to Botha's Hill, do not take off because you're going to hand me your quads. And when you get to Fields Hill, do not, you know, I'll, I'll take, we'll take them through the route. And, um, yeah, and it's just been, it's been incredibly rewarding. Uh, and it's at this stage, it's definitely not about making money, very much in our infancy. But hopefully we'll um, get to a stage where we can, and, and, and I've, never, I've never been driven much by money. I'm more driven by um, contribution and, and being happy, you know, and a lot of people, and to me, being happy is when, when a stranger comes up to you and says, Bruce, thank you for Parkrun. You changed my life. You can't pay the money for that. You cannot pay the money for that, you know, and it happens, you know. And, and uh, yeah, you get some criticism as well, but, it, yeah, it's a... Yeah, I think it I means, made it means it means noticeable. If people hate yeah. you, it means <laughs> it means you're doing something that's noticeable. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think as Churchill said, you haven't lived a life unless you've got some enemies. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's true. Well, Bruce, so I popped the link in the in the anyone Thank watching in whichever platform you can find out more at uh, fordusfusion.com. Bruce, it's been an honor chatting to you. Thanks no, so much thank for you. being so generous. And yeah, I hope to see you on the next loop of two oceans and maybe one day at the finish line of comrades. <laughs> Why one day? You know, Hell, why? No, I've, got two, I've got two young kids, so that's my excuse I'm holding on to for a while. Just no, that's your excuse to get out. Yeah. Get away. <laughs> All right, you we'll take this. Those two, those two young kids one day are going to say, Doctor, where's the form? I'll sign it. Okay, switch the machine off. You need to. <laughs> 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 and uh, Dad, I love you, but where there's a will, I want to be in it. <laughs> yeah, exactly.
No, awesome. thanks so much. Really like you do yourself a favor. It's a life altering. I, you know, so last thing I called it, I called it Wing Messenger, and it mm. sounds like a very pretentious title, but it isn't because the the comrade's logo, this little chap here, yeah, is Hermes, and he was the winged messenger of the Greek gods, and that's the comrade's badge, the comrade's logo. That's the that's the that's what's engraved on the medal. Hermes okay. was the Greek god of the roads, but he was the winged messenger, and he was the only god who had the power to go from the world of the past to the world of the future, to go to the world of the dead, to the world of the living. And so he could bring you messages from your ancestors, but he could also bring you messages from the old you to the new you. And I always say to people, once you've run comrades, you change forever. You're not the same person after you finish. You just never are. You're bolder, you're braver, you're stronger, you understand you can do almost anything you want, and you become a winged messenger. So that's why I called it that. So it wasn't a, like a pretentious title. That is, a, that is a compelling pitch. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> okay, Bruce, I'll let you go. Thanks so much again and all the best.